So we have some questions coming in. I want to, um, I got to uh, want to ask a question or two myself. Um, and uh, I was hoping uh, I'm going to have all, all three of you talk about the, the, the data sources you were using. Uh, Julie, you gave us a good, you gave us a description of the RAND, um, uh, the RAND panel. Could you just give us, give us the description again of the, the RAND survey, your survey instrument and how that, how that is structured. And then I'm going to ask Brian about uh, the, the iReady panel that you were using. Um, so Julia, could just give, you know, give the reporters out there kind of a, a, an overview of, of, your, of your data. Yep, so the RAND American Educator Panels compo are composed of the American Teacher Panel, the American School Leader Panel, and now we have a new school district panel for superintendents. Um, so these panels are put together by asking um, teachers and principals and school leaders from known lists randomly whether they would be willing to participate in the panels. And if they say yes, then they receive a couple surveys each year, two to four surveys each year, asking them um, what they think about various issues of education related to education. And so that's why we were very quickly able to mount a COVID survey in the spring. And then we did another survey in October. Now, if we have large enough samples, we can compare over time too. Um, for these particular COVID surveys, we can't compare over time because, but there is some crossover in the samples. There are about 500 teachers that responded in the spring and the fall. So we are looking at that data. It might not be nationally representative trend, trend data, but it still is really interesting to see what their reports look like in May and in October. So that's just kind of a snapshot of what our panels are. Okay, um, and Brian, if you could tell us, you use something called the Curriculum Associates iReady survey instrument. Can you tell us how is that structured? What exactly are they doing? Sure, so Curriculum Associates has uh, their iReady um, assessment. They have assessments in the fall, winter, uh, and spring. What we did is for apples to apples purposes, looked at fall 2020 and compared that to uh, the, pre, the three prior uh, fall results. We also restricted our data set to those surveys that were taken in person. Now those could have been taken in person by somebody that had been gone back to school or some schools actually bring in students just for the assessments. Uh, my students go to Fairfax County Public Schools and the only time they've been in the school building this fall has been for testing. Um, and so there are some schools that, um, that did pull in. Uh, we wanted to do that to make sure we got an accurate read because there is some noise in the data that we've seen when students take tests from home, the scores tend to be higher than if they took the tests in the school building controlling for all other factors. So we think that there, that noise others have attributed to well-intending parents wanting to help, other things happening in the environment that may lift it. So we wanted to get as accurate a picture as we could. So we focused on, on the, uh, the in-school population. Uh, the the iReady was taken across uh, about 25 states uh, in our sample. Uh, and again, it was apples to apples, so we could make sure we had uh, similar schools and similar populations taking it uh, this far compared to the prior three. Okay. And uh, Catherine, you, you made a lot of reference to the NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Can you just give, I know a lot of the education reporters out there are familiar with that and use it on a regular basis, but can you just give us a brief overview of exactly what it is how good a measure is it and how does it compare with state uh, level standardized tests? Yeah, so the, um, the, na it's the National Assessment of Education Progress is a federally run um, national assessment that does statistically, um, uh, it samples uh, students at grade four, grade eight and grade 12 across the country. Um, people will call it NAEP. As I mentioned before, there's three levels, basic, um, which is what it sounds like, proficient and advanced. Um, NAEP has been running for um, several decades since the, uh, the early, since around 2001, they've been doing, um, uh, they've been testing every two years in every state. Um, 
and for fourth and publishing fourth and eighth grade scores. As I said, 12th grade is unfortunately only available for the, for the whole country that you can't get, there's not state by state 12th grade uh, data. Um, so this is, is a wonderful resource. You, you, there's a data, um, an interactive data uh, uh, thing on the, on the, on the NAEP site. Um, so you can get data for any, for, for a, a particular state um, they break down data by multiple subgroups. You can get data by, um, by race and ethnicity. Um, at the one that I was talking about before is um, free, you can get data broken down by free and reduced price lunch. What you'll see if you look at the data on the NAEP site is that African-American students perform by far the worst and worse than the lower income group. I think the reason for that is it's essentially a proxy for poverty. I think that when you look at the quote lower income group, that group is probably not as poor as the the group that um, that that NAEP categorizes categorizes as as black. Um, so it's widely respected. Um, when No Child Left Behind, which was a major school reform effort launched by um, by George Bush in two thousand and one they emphasized using the federal assessment as a benchmark for states. What they first found is that uh, the, the, the um, states, children were doing much, much better on state tests than they were doing on NAEP tests. And it actually uh, led many states to raise the standards so that kids could, so that they would really know um, parents and the public would really understand how kids were doing um, rather than um, uh, uh, refor revising a test to ensure that kids were doing well, which was what was going on. Chris, does that answer the question? Yeah, that's very helpful. So okay. I'm going to um, I'm gonna get to some uh, questions from our viewers here in a second, but Tyler, I was hoping you could pull up the, the web browser. Um, I just want to uh, let the, the, all of you know, um, on our website, we will be we will be linking to a to a lot of resources, including work from each of the speakers here. So, uh, Tyler, if you could just click through these, we have a couple of the Rand. Or I'm sorry, a couple of the McKinsey studies, um, and uh, we must must take those cookies. Uh, a and uh, we have uh, Catherine's work at the AEI, and we have Julia's work at Rand. Um, uh, so this is another another article from Catherine, and now and now Julia's work at Rand. So we will have links to these, so you can you know get the original reports as well as their you know find out more about the dat data sources that you're using. So Tyler, you can you can drop that. Um, and I want to get to some questions. Um, this first one is coming from Bart uh, Fankutch, uh, who is with South Dakota News Watch. Um, I'm, a, I'm not sure who to direct this to, so, so all of you be alert on this. I'm a reporter in South Dakota working on a piece on access to higher education, and I wonder how, how or if these K-12 trends may translate to the future of higher education in terms of readiness, access, and equity for lower income or minority students, specifically Native Americans in South Dakota. I mean, so does anybody have a sense about whether what you're seeing now is going to have an impact on when you know people are going or attempting to go into higher ed, you know, a year or two or more down the road. I mean, even though the research we did focused on K through five, other work we've done, including looking at uh, NAEP scores over time, shows that what you do in third grade, by the time you hit third grade, is actually predictive of the outcomes. And so I think what this says is, and there's other. Uh, examples, I mean, we cite in our report in Pakistan, when, um, you know, due to natural disaster, some learning was disrupted. Uh, the students that were most affected by that disruption had uh, worse outcomes, you know, through the rest of their school time. And, you know, in fact, you know, had uh, earning outcome challenges. So I think that the data that I've seen would argue that if left uncorrected, if we don't take some of the measures like the acceleration academies, like the tutoring, if we don't make a concerted effort to catch people up um, and to supplement this, you know, I think you will see uh, this having effect into higher education and beyond. 
Okay. I'll just um, add that our surveys did ask um, principals and teachers to project um, college enrollment for their students back in the spring. And they did indicate that college enrollment they thought would be lower, you know, for what that's worth. I do, I do think that um, there, there are, you know, tutoring has been mentioned by Catherine, it's been mentioned by Brian. I think it's, it's, a, it's a great idea. I, I know that in the places where I've seen tutoring thus far, there are the students that need it the most often don't take advantage of it. And sometimes it's not well aligned with the curriculum in the schools. And so what the students are learning and what they're getting tutoring on sometimes it does, isn't a great match unless you can. So for tutoring, I think it's, it's, it's an awesome idea. And I think we need to make sure it's aligned with what the school's doing and helpful to the schools um, rather than say, hey, here's a bucket of tutors for you. How can we create partnerships you know, to make that tutoring as useful as possible and provide the tutors with training to make sure they know what's going on with their with the students. So I, I think I agree with folks about tutoring. I agree with the acceleration ideas. I think the students that need it most sometimes don't take advantage of those opportunities. Okay. Um, is Catherine, you had a thought? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in to just say very quickly, the model that I think is, I encourage people to look at that, that England just launched um, a few weeks ago They've they 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 they're they they're um, selecting um, specific tutors. So they've got 400 applicants from tutoring companies. They've selected 33. They have a website. And Julie, to your point, the school picks the tutor tutoring company that they want to work work with. And they're they're some of them are for profit companies like Kaplan or whatever. Um, the federal the the national government is um, is underwriting it. Um, but, but that's, I think what you said, Julie, is very important. And that was something that was very impressive to me about their plan, the way they were letting the school make the choices, but they were providing resources that had been very, um, very thoroughly checked out. Okay. So Kathy, you mentioned the UK program. You also, when we were talking before, we talked about um, uh, tutoring programs in a couple of states that are, that there's evidence for them. Could you give me a little more sense of who has done this and how big a scope have those programs been? Yeah. So the one that um, that uh, th that I have think is really impressive is called the Minnesota Reading Corps. Um, the um, a, a research institute at University of Chicago recently did a couple of evaluations on them and um, found that it was advancing kids like a like a year. Uh, you know, not oftentimes with education interventions, the, the, the result you get is there, maybe they got ahead maybe six weeks, um, but really massive um, gains. And um, that program, the, the, the Minnesota Reading Corps, which uses AmeriCorps volunteers, which is, a, the, as people probably know, the AmeriCorps is a federal program. Um, people get paid, not, not a ton, but it's like a, you get a, a, enough to live on. Um, so that to me would be a very, uh, that, that, that it's potentially very exciting to expand AmeriCorps and connect that with tutors, uh, with tutoring programs. Um, so that's in 12 states now. Ten, the Tennessee Tutoring Corps is just being launched in Tennessee now, specifically to be dealing with COVID. Um, the North Carolina Education Corps is also just being launched. It's going to be up and running in January. So Clearly, you know, people all seem to be thinking about this, and it does seem to me that that that's a that's a very that would be a very constructive role for the federal government would be to expand AmeriCorps and provide funding to to some kind of a, an initiative that uh, that it, that enables um, tutoring companies to be um, to be vetted. So that that um, schools that and but in letting schools decide which ones they're using. So I just want to say one quick thing about the way that the 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 England program, they've got two components. One is the tutoring uh, programs like a Kaplan or whatever that a school can choose to partner with. That's part one. Part two is what they're calling academic mentors, which is more what we've been talking about with tutors. Those are actually human human. Those are human beings who are working with kids one on one, one on two in the classroom. So they're doing both at the same time, um, which I think makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, yeah, I want, I want to go to a question for Julia here. Uh, Tyler, if you could pull up that last slide, I guess slide forty. Julia, I mean these are your you, these are your conclusions or your your. Uh, 
recommendations. Could you maybe talk a little bit more about the, you know, you, you note that there should be funding and resources should be directed to schools delivering remote instructions. Um, how would you, I mean, do you have a mechanism for how this would happen and, and um, is it, would it go by, uh, you know, a function of what percentage is remote or, or how would you, how would you mm -hmm. work through your implicate your, your policy suggestions here? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think the CARES Act did kind of direct money to schools to support remote instruction, right? And that went to a lot of states that had high COVID rates. And so these were places like, you know, Rhode Island, like places that have a fairly good internet infrastructure and they were able to use those fundings to do better. Um, I think that's really important. Um, there are places like Mississippi, like Louisiana, where there's just not an infrastructure, enough infrastructure to build on. And uh, you know, that, this is a longstanding problem. This isn't gonna be solved by COVID, but I'm hoping, you know, it would be great if COVID could usher in more focus on getting broadband access to all those people, because it doesn't matter just for learning. It matters for so many things, right? It matters for whether people can access the internet for such a large range of reasons. Um, so there can't be anything wrong with directing funding and resources towards that. It's a tough call to figure out where to direct the resources to schools. I do know that, you know, schools that have higher COVID rates are, have gotten some of that funding should get more because CARES Act funding has more or less been spent or is being spent. Um, it, it, we saw from all the data that I showed that the schools that are delivering remote instruction, teachers have greater needs, assignments aren't getting done. There's no reason to think that supporting those schools by helping them get digital access, by getting internet, by getting um, digital devices to these children won't help them do better. I know that some schools as recently as October, November, still hadn't given all their students devices despite the fact that sometimes they were remote. And that's a frightening that piece of information, right? That what are these students doing at home is a, is a kind of um, concerning question. And then of course, if we're gonna go in person, we need to collect as much data as we can on safety precautions, as well as figure out, you know, if there was some federal message about the thresholds that were really important to keep an eye on, we wouldn't have all these different ideas about the thresholds that matter across states. So that's one thing, but also collecting as much data as we can. Right now, there are schools that are trying COVID testing. There are lots of schools that have a range of safety options. We're trying to collect data on that to really understand the extent to which various safety options are related to better outcomes. It's too soon to know anything, but you know, safety precautions like COVID testing, if it's possible to mount, could make teachers feel better about going to the classroom, could make families better about send, feel better about sending their students to the classroom. Okay. Uh, all right. So I just have a, we have time for a few more questions. Um, you know, this is kind of a basic one. Um, I was wondering how, how long can we expect the, rem the remote side of the learning is going to go on. I mean, do we, do you all have a sense of what it's going to look like in the spring? Um, what it's going to look like at, you know, at the start of this, the second semester and at the end of the second semester, how, how much of learning is going to be remote? Um, I mean, from your, from your work, what do you, do you have an idea on that? We don't, I mean, and because it was a fair amount of work and extrapolation to get a view of you know, what is currently remote versus hybrid versus in-person. Uh, and those are, you know, those decisions are changing as COVID conditions are changing. And so it's hard to get an exact view on what the numbers are. I think what we are able to see though, is that the learning outcomes will vary depending on which scenario we're in, in terms of the mix of in-person, hybrid, and remote learning, that mix will influence what the learning outcomes are. So the, the, when we can get back to school safely, that will be, you know, hopefully we can get to a point where, you know, we're able to safely get back to school because we know that's where the outcomes are the best. Okay. Yeah, and I think just to add, you know, I think we've been consistently, including myself, consistently saying, oh, schools will come back soon, right? In the spring, we're like, oh, in the fall, they'll be back. You know, and then we got to fall, oh, you know, a couple months, they'll be back. And I think that that, that um, focus on getting back to school is distracting us from the, the, the remote learning that's happening and the support that needs to happen in those remote settings, right? So we're like, oh, any time now. And we know right now COVID infection rates are getting higher. So there's, there's no reason to think remote learning isn't going to continue for a while longer. 
Chris, can I just jump sure. in here for a quick yeah. second? Yeah, and I just want to underscore that when schools were open, in every state, as you'll see in the in the in the in the, in the map that we put together, in every state in DC, in 2000 in 2019, more than one third of lower income, which means more than one third of 46% of the eighth graders were not able to demonstrate even minimal competence in math and reading. That was before COVID. So I, what would be concerning, I think actually, would be to, would be to become so caught up in, in repairing COVID damage that we lose sight of how poorly the schools were performing for so many children beforehand. I think this is, so there's, this is, Julie, to your point, this is a wonderful moment to realize we need to be getting broadband to kids. And I also think it's a wonderful moment to be looking at what is working in schools and what isn't uh, and how we can be improving it. Because for, there are a whole lot of kids where it's now, it's a COVID is a disaster. There are a whole lot of other kids. It was already a disaster for them long before COVID. Okay, uh, uh, Catherine, a question for you. Um, this is this is uh, this is from Naz Modan, a reporter for K Twelve Dive. Um, we kind of touched on this before, but I just want to get some clarity on it on the tutoring programs. Which states have launched statewide tutoring programs that can serve as examples for the rest of the nation? You, you mentioned you mentioned Minnesota and Tennessee. It's yeah. So there's so if you so if you go to the um, it's called Minnesota Reading Corps. I don't have the list of the of the twelve states they've just expanded to. Um, but it, but it's on their website. So if you go to Minnesota Reading Corps, they have the data um, from their two evaluations, which is super impressive, and the list of the 12 states. Then uh, Tennessee, um, Tennessee Tutoring Corps, um, that's the name of it, and that's online. Um, North Carolina Education Corps, those are the ones that I'm aware of. And then the, 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 the England program, the UK program, um, is called the National Tutoring Program, and they've got their website's great. They have a lot of they a lot of uh, information about what they're doing and why and how they're doing it. It's okay. worth checking out. All right. So um, we just have time for a question or two more. If you have a question out there, uh, su submit it in the Q and A function. Um, and uh, but Brian, I did you want to ask you about uh, we've been we've been talking about your report that came out this week. You also had a study in June of this year, um, and I was hoping you could just give us a touch a little bit on what it was you were reporting in June, what it was you were reporting this week, how they and how they differed in in your methodology, and what you know, what reporters can learn from the the two reports. Uh, so what we did in June is we uh, took a statistical modeling approach to model what we thought might happen on learning loss. And so what we knew in June was what happened in summer learning loss. What we knew in June was the relative effectiveness of uh, remote learning. Uh, there was a study at Stanford uh, on remote learning in charter schools. And we knew that remote learning wasn't as effective uh, in general as, uh, as in-person learning. And we also knew that uh, students of color were not logging on to the curriculum associates uh, programs at the same rate as white students. So we took those pieces of data together to predict a range of scenarios of what could happen in the fall. Uh, what, what ended up happening in the fall, the worst case scenario did not come true, but some of our moderate scenarios look pretty close to where uh, the results turned out in the fall. So at the beginning, you know, in, in the spring, it was projecting what would happen. And now it's looking at the report card. Okay. And I want to ask you about one, one other uh, McKinsey study. I was re reviewing your other work. You had a McKinsey study from several years ago, but that was putting a, you know, essentially a price tag on the U.S. economy for the achievement gap between Black and white. You said that the, the, the gap between white and Black and Hispanic students deprived the U.S. economy of $310 billion to $525 billion a year in productivity, or 2 to 4% of GDP. And if you're looking at the achievement gap between high income and low income, it was the same, although even a little more pronounced. So how do you, uh, just explain, how do you come up with those estimates of the cost to GDP? Uh, so a researcher at Stanford, Eric Hanushek, has shown that lower scores 
on uh, our tests on reading and math, lower scores there create a drag on our overall GDP. And as a drag on the GDP, that compounds every year. So as you know, countries move up in the education of the workforce, their GDP grows faster. Uh, as uh, education lags, GDP slows. And so what we did is we said, let's say, let's take a nation at risk, which is a seminal report came out in the early uh, 80s. Let's say that 15 years after a nation at risk, so a generation of students later, we had closed the gaps. And so that took us from, uh, I think, 1983 to uh, 1998. 10 years later, when we wrote that report, was uh, 2008, early 2009. So we said, OK, if we'd solved the problem and everything was there, what would our GDP have been in, 2000, um, in late 2008 compared to where it actually was? And that, it was that methodology that we used to show that uh, the achievement gap was the equivalent of a permanent national recession. Wow, okay. And, and, the, and the gaps, the opportunity gap, um, to Catherine's point, you know, it's fluctuated a little bit, but the fundamental story uh, hasn't changed um, much in the 10 years since we, um, I guess now 11 or 12 years since we released that report. 